Yeah, Khan asked me last week um, what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, and to be honest, Donald Trump had just been elected president of the United States. Uh, and I am a dual citizen. I live um, most of my time in New Zealand now, but I spent uh, a decade of my creative life working in the US. I'm probably going to spend six months there next year when I go on study leave. Um, my husband was born in Los Angeles. My children are US citizens as well. Uh, and I was just terribly depressed when he wrote to me, what are you going to talk about? Uh, and, I, and I wrote back, pessimism. <laughs> I'm going to talk about pessimism. And I've had a week and a half to kind of process my grief at what is happening to my other home at the moment. Um, my friends in California have, I would say, not processed that grief, actually. The, the word that I get back from America is really, really dark. And so when I talk about fantasy today, I'm mostly going to frame my own photographic practice in terms of dystopian fan fantasy, the dystopian fantasy of the likes of Octavia Butler, and James Tiptree Jr. Um, Octavia Butler was a science fiction writer who lived in Pasadena, which is about 15 minutes from where I usually live um, in California, uh, in Los Angeles, in northeast Los Angeles. Um, so she traversed very, very similar uh, actual landscapes to the ones that I was extremely familiar with uh, when I was uh, taking a bunch of photographs that you'll see today. Um, so. So um, fantasy rubs both ways, eh? You know, we can, we can um, immerse ourselves in potential, but we're in a really dangerous moment. Uh, and I think what I felt like I could bring to any kind of pu public conversation right now was this dual nationality that I have to negotiate uh, and was my own um, lived experience of um, the American political reality that affects us all in a really, really immediate and primary way here, um, you know, from the inside uh, as a creative practitioner. And I'm primarily a photographer. Uh, I work in video photography um, and sculpture. I'm, my degrees are in sculpture. Um, so that's my medium, but um, my position in relation to what we all, I think, in the room make, which is images and objects, is that they are becoming the most powerful political pivot points on earth, right? Images and objects are where, are where, are where, are where, the, where politics hits the road, actually, in terms of uh, our progression as uh, a species and a biosphere. Uh, so I regard um, my practice and the practice of, uh, that, I, uh, that I pursue as a teacher, also at the University of Auckland, as essentially unpacking all the philosophy of objects and images, okay, how they function in the world. And because uh, we are now operating in an utterly image-saturated global environment, um, I'm kind of here to think about the implications of that through this science fiction lens and through this experience of, um, of dual nationality and voting in that crazy election that just happened. Um, so that's what I thought I would do. So um, first I'm going to show uh, just a couple of images. Um, that are Im important to me uh, that I am interested in. Uh, and uh, I work across a lot of different photographic disciplines, um, but one of the things that I've done is um, produced work with highly anachronistic photographic uh, materials, wet plate collodion, daguerreotype, ambrotype, um, mid-19th century technologies, in order specifically to point my viewer toward the moment in which modernity struck a bunch of the different environments that I work in, to essentially point directly to the 1850s and 1860s. Um, and so in terms of the United States, that points directly to the, US Civil, the American Civil War and also to the uh, incorporation of Los Angeles as a city, where I lived for a long time. Um, 
And because those technologies were the primary technologies in play during that period, I think my viewer is immediately taken back to that moment in time. As soon as they see my images, they wonder if they were made then, and then they get to think through what constitutes a contemporary approach to issues that emerged in that period. Uh, in terms of my work, the primary project I've been pursuing in uh, Aotearoa for the last seven or eight years now uh, is in my hometown, well outside of my hometown of Wairoa on the east coast and again in that context I'm using those technologies specifically to point to the moment when the colonial project really engaged and really caused traumatic um, uh, a kind of a wave of traumatic memory that exists to this day in that environment. I use those technologies in, to, in order to hook my audience back into that time. Do we have an image up there at the moment? Or Yeah, yeah. So we have this um, John Reiki image um, from 18, 18, actually it's from 1865. And what, it's, it's obviously an incredibly traumatic image, okay? It's a, it's a dark, dark image. And, and I am, as an artist, actually generally attracted to fairly existential material. That's just my own sensibility, really. Um, but this image, I think, in terms of what it, what it brings us to think about is, is the immediacy of the racial divide in the United States and the immediacy of the trauma that, that it emerges from. Um, my own work in Wairoa has led me to be really, really aware that there are still people living now in their 90s who can talk to me about people they knew who were born in the late 1860s, okay? So you're only looking, in terms of lived memory, at one or two or three degrees of separation from this level of trauma out of which our nations emerged. And in the US, that trauma is of a whole very distinctive and extraordinarily dark nature. And I think that I'm myself trying to process what on earth is going on right now. And so when I come, and I've used this image many times in many PowerPoints to talk about the importance and the interest of wet paint collodion. But right now, what this image is doing for me is functioning as a kind of a portal into the immediacy of what is occurring right now, which is kind of like flipping back and forward for me as an image, if, if that makes sense. So I wanted, um, to you to think about that. Um, so we can, sorry, I don't have a thing. <laughs> we can move on to the next image, um, which is an image by Alexander Gardner of one of the Lincoln conspirators uh, as he um, faced his own um, imminent execution. Uh, again, thinking about the immediacy of, of this imagery and the pivot, the existential pivot that exists in the image. Um, Oh, oh, you don't have that next image, do you? No, I do. Um, okay, so now, th th do you have the next image? Yeah. Um, this is a, a, I love and despair at this image. And um, it's an image by Harold Egerton, uh, shot with a rapidronic camera. You, many of you will be familiar with these images. Uh, shot in Nevada um, during the, um, first development of uh, atomic bombs and the first microseconds of, of um, one of those detonations. And what strikes me about these images is that they're not particularly familiar. We're not, we're not immediately inured to them. They, they affect us because actually they have the kind of primal, um, primordial uh, effect of being like a kind of a grotesque, monstrous birth. Uh, and I've been to... Um, Nevada. I've shot very near Trinity. Um, I've shot um, in White Sands, New Mexico. I've kind of travelled this trail. I was actually I acquired um, uh, security access to visit these sites, and then freaked myself out and decided not to go. You actually can't take photographs um, on the Trinity site, but you can once a year go on a kind of um, a, a kind of bus tour a kind of sentimental bus tour that you can apply to and you, you know, have a picnic at the Trinity site uh, or at the Mercury site in, um, in Nevada. So I, I, I gained access to the Nevada site but, but didn't follow through. And I have friends that have visited those sites and, and have come out with a profound sense of struggle. Anyway, so, so these images have been really important to me because again, they break through, right? They are very, very, they remain extremely hard to look at. And if you can see the little trees at the bottom there, which are the yucca trees, which are, you know, a couple, you know, 
story and a half, two stories high, you get the sense of the immensity of this explosive um, monstrous, monstrosity. Um, <laughs> John Carter's The Thing. The Thing is important to me as a film. Uh, I did, actually, I've been to Antarctica, right? And I went to Antarctica um, during the height of the George Bush administration, at the height of, of global climate denial. And uh, of course, it was absolutely gobsmackingly infuriating to live in the United States during this period of climate denial. And my whole practice is entangled with ideas about ecology and systems. And so it was a really, really hard place to be at that time. And for me, this, this recent election brought back the trauma of the, the Gore Bush decision, right? And being in Los Angeles at the moment of the Gore Bush decision and the Supreme Court, the right wing Supreme Court, essentially flicking an election over into another, you know, six years of climate change denial in the United States. And this is, of course, the reason none of us can ignore what's going on in, in the US right now. This is the, the, the core issue. We do not have another three, six, nine years to burn on this problem. We've used all our time up, it's over, it's gone. And yet we are entering another period where I just grip onto any vague mention by Trump that he may have decided to reassess the situation. I'm just desperate to buy into that idea that, that things might turn around with this. Um, so the thing, this uh, amazing John Carpenter film uh, set, in, um, set in Antarctica has been quite pivotal for me. Um, now I might have to move quite fast here. Do we? How much time do we have? Or we just relax. We relax. So the rest of this uh, of this series of images is it's really work that I generated either in the U.S. in direct response to living in that environment, or um, or in Antarctica in direct response to living in that environment. Uh, and I'm really focusing in on that work uh, and and that idea and the thing of uh, contagion of. Um, uh, mutuality of symbiosis uh, and of parasitism um, that um, that drives that narrative the enemy within that we can't recognize that takes our own form which I think is really really taken over in terms of the paranoid politics of the US at the moment um, that that kind of idea uh, around contagion and interiority that is very forceful in that particular piece of science fiction film um, was something I was playing around with uh, a lot, I guess, during my years as a practitioner. And the first series that I made that directly engaged with it uh, was um, LA Bloom. I had just moved to Los Angeles. I was finding it a really, really difficult city to get around, absolutely enormous, constantly blocked with traffic. And my response to that, stupidly, was to decide to go and take microbial samples from every quadrant of my Thomas Guide, which was my pre-GPS, I still don't use GPS, um, uh, map system of the Los Angeles County and so every so I did that I, I drew up the entire county as a series of quadrants and drove myself through absolutely relentless traffic to a little dot on the map scraped soil samples up scraped um, uh, uh, fungus off plant material and then enumerated that material on um, agar plates and produced contact photograms, contact photographs uh, of this mapping of the Los Angeles County biosphere, if you like, uh, in a kind of pseudo-scientific attempt to um, open up the question of where things bloom and where things cannot bloom, where water exists in Los Angeles and where a kind of um, um, grasping um, parasitic relationship to the landscape exists through uh, irrigation. So very, very wealthy areas of Los Angeles are deeply irrigated and pr produce beautiful photographic prints in my, in my um, kind of pseudo-analysis of the environment. Um, whereas in other places I would have to go into absolutely uh, desiccated, you know, dusty backwaters um, down somewhere near uh, Long Beach since gentrified and, uh, and, and you know, just grab a, a little sample and get the hell out of there. Um, and so it was a really, really fascinating way to get to know the city uh, because I would just be stuck deep in uh, these different like kind of map points randomly out to Zuma, up to CalArts, you know, 
out to Azusa, working out the city, but it was also uh, a very physical, visceral way to attempt to understand it. At that point, I was living in downtown Los Angeles, um, which was a massive homeless encampment, but also on the pivot of gentrifying artists like me, always accidentally gentrify environments that they find fascinating. Um, and so I was living in a building with a bunch of other actually amazing creative people who have since gone on to stellar, amazing careers. It's all really weird how you find yourself in those places and then you can think back on them later. Um, but at the same time, there were 10,000 homeless uh, people living literally on the street within a five or six block radius of uh, our apartment. Um, you know, we were, we were raided by not the local police, but um, actually the neighbouring uh, police unit because of the crack cocaine that was being dealt out of the basement car park that we had to negotiate. It was a really, really difficult environment. And so I, um, I, w I was working with that environment at the time, and hopefully that leads us on to the next image. Or, so this is Griffith Park, by the way, and this is Venice Beach, enumerated as a sort of yeast field. Um, and this is an image of that work as a map, um, as, as an entire quadrant of the Los Angeles County. Um, this piece, uh, the next piece here, is uh, it's called Imperfect Empire, and it was likewise a microbial mapping of a part of the larger Los Angeles region. But this was uh, shot in the Inland Empire, which is the area of California that was hardest hit and, and functions as the epicentre of the global financial crisis. And I had thought that I was going to a rather beautiful or orange grove kind of neighbourhood area to do a project for a photographic museum, but I was asked by the curator to do a piece that specifically related to the landscape uh, of the city. Um, uh, Riverside that I was working in, Riverside, right? And they said, look, there's a beautiful, um, multi, you know, multi-kilometer um, cycle track and you can walk through that and you can get samples from the river. You can map the river. And so myself and actually Anne Shelton, who by the way, has a massive retrospective opening at the Auckland Art Gallery tonight, went on a backpacking trip along this cycleway, which turned out to be the access point for a massive homeless encampment that had built itself up about around the Riverside River and was essentially a bunch of blue tarpaulins and you could hear people laughing and fighting in there and there was feces on the on the pathway and ripped underwear and at one point a guy walked out Anne and I were actually talking about the Tarkovsky, amazing Tarkovsky movie, Stalker. We were like, oh my God, this is like Stalker, you know, all the stuff lying on the ground, there's needles, there's like, you know. And um, as we were saying the word Stalker, a guy walked out of the bush with his water container and a uh, supermarket trolley and a machete. And he just walked up to us with a machete. And we were, we're like, hi, trying to be all like nice New Zealand girls, let's move along. And it was a shocking moment of thinking, did he think we were calling him a stalker? Was he a stalker? Why did he have a machete? And uh, so we had this very, very dark experience of Riverside, which really to me now seems really uh, prescient because that area of the US has been so hard hit by the global financial crisis that there were literally wild dogs in packs roaming the streets and people were warned about it on the news to not approach them. You know, I mean, it's just wild what happened in that part of the country. So that's Riverside, there you go. Um, and so I was living in that downtown environment and I was kind of dealing metaphorically with that life in that place at that time. And so I started working in an abstract way, uh, digging into my feelings about the city that I couldn't really picture within my own aesthetic. And so I started working actually with crystals and models and photographing those models and thinking about this shattered society that was simultaneously um, incredibly appealing and attractive and, um, and faceted and so I made this series Brittle City and I showed this alongside um, the work of a good friend of mine Connie Samara, somebody who's deeply interested in dystopic fiction and has an amazing oeuvre of work that largely revolves around places like again Antarctica but also Dubai and um, the, um, the kind of military industrial complex in, uh, in the US and so I showed it alongside her works of 9-11 because I was living in downtown when 9-11 occurred and my husband who at that point was a lawyer worked working in the Wells Fargo Twin Towers in Los Angeles, um, 
was literally working next door to the library tower, the highest building on the west coast, which was the other target, right? The, the kind of, they decided not to bother to fly the planes into the library tower. So he was on the 44th floor of that building. Uh, and so when we woke up at 6.30 or 7 in the morning, ready to go to work, um, his building was shut down for two weeks after the um, Twin Towers attack. But, but our initial reaction to, you know, there are planes going into, you know, it was, like, it was just on national radio, it was happening live as we woke up, um, was I started packing my stuff to go camping. I thought I would go to the desert. I thought I'm going to get the hell out of Los Angeles and go to the desert because what are we doing here? This is crazy. Someone's going to fly a plane into downtown Los Angeles, which they were in fact at one point planning to do. Um, I wasn't allowed to go to the desert because I actually worked at a high school and they were like, are you kidding? We have kids that are going to be dropped off at school and you need to turn up to work. So I spent the entire day, I drove on a completely empty freeway out to Santa Monica. There was nobody, there was nobody. My husband kind of loitered around at the supermarket not knowing what to do. We didn't see any of what happened during the day. I taught these kids and then I kind of drove home and we kind of huddled and finally saw the censored version of what had actually occurred. So, so those kind of pivotal moments, they inflected my practice. And in this particular case, I exhibited these brittle city works downtown, in downtown uh, Los Angeles, um, which was scaled so that you could essentially crawl into the photographs. And they're all hand printed, by the way, which was insane, but this is pre-digital. Um, and they're 22 feet long, and you know, I was making them in the basement. Um, but I showed them alongside and in direct relation to these very, very strange sculptural night shots of the, um, the um, Twin Towers in a state of collapse by Connie Samaras. And we really wanted to make that juxtaposition really direct. Um, and what have I got next? Oh yeah, so, so in all of this, I was desperately trying to get to Antarctica and I was living in climate change denial America. I think my computer just went dead, so I'm just gonna look at yours. Uh, not know quite what's coming up. Uh, and I had to go to Montana to learn to make daguerreotypes because I decided George, Bo George Bush was in this kind of crazy, do I or don't believe this thing that is climate change as if this is an issue of belief, for heaven's sake, right? Is this really about belief? Uh, and we're still in this insane situation in which climate change is discussed in terms of belief rather than any kind of evidentiary relationship in the United States. And so I went to Montana to learn to make daguerreotypes because I decided I was going to produce a photographic form that had never been shot on that continent and that preceded the colonial exercise in Antarctica completely in terms of its timing. So it went out of favour at about 1855 and we didn't make it to Antarctica until uh, 1906. Um, and I was going down there exactly 100 years after that, which is the only reason I remember that date. And so I decided to make this really, really difficult form, um, but that was essentially so fragile in its photographic materiality that you could not adjust it without that being evident because we're in this moment of fluffy science that's belief and digital photography that's infinitely malleable and I wanted to say I know photograph photography's never really been evidentiary but let's you know at least at least play with the idea that it might have some evidentiary value right so that's why I shot daguerreotype in Antarctica but I learned the daguerreotype process in Montana and the image that you just saw was that by chance when I was in Montana I was at Glacier National Park where there are almost no glaciers left and there was a massive forest fire. So what you're seeing there was my first playing around with my camera, the previous image, um, that I just bought for Antarctica in the bizarre context of a huge forest fire caused by beetles in the pine forests that are no longer killed by the ice off every year that used to happen in, the, in Glacier National Park. So these wildfires are now absolutely pervasive in the United States because of a sort of insect relationship to the, um, to the uh, pine forest that doesn't get interrupted uh, by ice. Uh, so then, in that context, I went to Antarctica with the brittle city and the Montana fires in the background, and that's me with a, in the Barn Glacier, little, big. And, and when you're down there, the thing that you experience that nobody gets to experience when they think about you know, beautiful, dramatic images of Antarctica is the scale of this thing in terms of what you can and can't do to ice. If you imagine this amount of ice collapsing and our fantasies as a technological society about how we might prevent its collapse, the actual experience of viscerally embodied standing in front of those glaciers makes that hubris, the hubris around our scientific project, absolutely ludicrous, right? So you're there looking at that and going, there's nothing we can do once 
you turn this freezer off. You know, it's just nothing. It's slush. And it's a very, and I had fantasies when I first had my children, I had a three-year-old son at this point, of like building kind of elaborate, a dream about building elaborate armatures to hold it up, you know, just to hold it back. This fantasy of always trying to make things work, but never, knowing really that it's an extraordinarily complex task. Okay, so we'll move through some of these Antarctic images quite fast. Um, and I printed these again very, very large in order to think about the immersive qualities, to try to communicate that immersive quality. Uh, this is the dry valleys, yeah, wow. That's where they test Mars rovers. That's the most lifeless place on Earth. And experiencing that is experiencing again, physically, in your body, what climate means because it's impossible to imagine living in environments like that for more than about 30 minutes. In fact, our helicopter was half an hour late and things work like this in Antarctica. Stuff is never late. And the nervousness of our guides as it became evident that, we're, that the schedule was off was really, really palpable. It was fascinating. So anyway, anyway, we'll move on. These are the, some of the daguerreotypes I shot there. Um, again, trying to think about the, um, uh, the continent picturing itself at some level. I wondered if the continent would express its fury to me at some point. Uh, and so we'll move the slides through. And so in this place, at this sort of mini glacier, um, the continent did express its fury to me. I, it, it showed itself to me. It gave me a kind of a gift. So we'll just move on. Um, sorry, these are just some other margin images of fun. Um, with, with this image, which was my treasure actually from my trip to Antarctica, which is a daguerreotype that I made of a form in the ice, which to me was just the most savage, raging articulation, kind of gothic articulation of this feeling that I had that, that it could flick us off at any instant and that it was furious with us. Um, and I, I actually initially had a, an image of Frankenstein after this image, which I don't have now. Um, but, it, but that image of Frankenstein and my thinking about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as a piece of amazingly prescient science fiction that posits the idea of the opening up of the Northern Passage or the discovery of the Northern Passage, which of course has just occurred because we have just changed the climate. The fact that she, as about a 20-year-old young woman, wrote about that at the birth of the Industrial Revolution and could anticipate scientific hubris leaving, leading us to this moment, it's really amazing to me. So that's like a piece of science fiction that I kind of love. Have we got time here? Am I going on? Can I talk, shall I just talk faster? A little bit of time. Um, and then Katrina happened, or maybe I'm getting my orders wrong, but Katrina happened in the US, right? And uh, I was living there with my two-year-old son, and um, the government completely neglected thousands of people sitting on the roofs of their houses, drowning, dying, didn't even bring in any helicopters. It was such a shocking thing for me as a New Zealander and with my little son that I started desperately thinking about how the hell I could survive in Los Angeles if the government abdicated all responsibility. And my ridiculous, fantastical solution was I've seen some kind of wheat plants growing around on the hills near here. It was this plant actually, um, and it's actually barley, and it was planted around the hills of Los Angeles to prevent erosion. And I had the fantasy that I would harvest it, because I'm a farm girl, and then I was like, oh, there's 14 million other people in Los Angeles, and maybe they'll harvest it too, and maybe I won't be able to save my child. And it's that constant flicking back and forth between fantasy and the cold, hard fact of that place that I've like kind of lived with for, for a long time, and that's the role of fantasy right so we'll keep moving uh, and so I did a whole series of amber types um, a technique that was invented the year Los Angeles was incorporated in order to think through how people had survived in that landscape and how much they'd forgotten about how much they had relied on the landscape uh, and so I did LA Botanical a great big series of uh, plants that had been utilized in the past in that environment brought to that environment and then um, and then forgotten, essentially. Um, so we'll move through those, and sacred plants. And then, and that's a tomato plant, actually, that I found on the Crown Coach site where I was um, asked to make a series. Uh, another homeless encampment where people had planted tomatoes in order to try to eke out a life, or maybe eaten a tomato. Um, but you know, those food plants um, exist in those desolate, petrochemical saturated uh, areas of downtown Los Angeles, it's sort of an abundance, fascinating, fascinatingly. Um, and I really have to move, don't I? 
This is a cougar close in uh, the Chiricahua uh, National Park. Um, I'm really thinking about the last the places of last resort in terms of wild America, and Chiricahua was uh, a place of last resort um, for several really, really important um, uh, Native American fighters also. Uh, and I stupidly set up my large format camera in front of a place where I could see large puma fresh puma prints. Um, yeah, carry on, sorry. Uh, so this is Chiricahua, yeah. And then this uh, is really the last series I want to show you, um, a series that I shot in uh, some Bureau of Land Management land just out of um, uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, just north of Mecca in, in California uh, and, and just south of Joshua Tree National Park. And what is really, really amazing about BLM land is that it's owned by the government, but it's not really managed. And so it's the place where people go to shoot their guns. It's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, bullets on the ground. Uh, it's the place where people go to um, race their ATVs. And so I've camped there in the past and had people actually shoot through my campsite and with, with balaclavas on and come out and gone, hey, hey, could you just like stop because you're about to shoot us? It was the strangest thing and they did stop. Um, and, and so in that area, I, I went to that place again and I think this is where this work really overlaps with someone like Octavia Butler who in works like Parable of the Sower thinks about the implications of government collapse in the US and, um, and the, the occupation of the deserts the very, very uh, intensely occupied quality to the deserts of the US. So this is where a lot of people live now in Slab City, just north of the Salton Sea, which is uh, where people take their um, caravans and trucks and live in those environments in a kind of like self-built communities. This is just north of there. And what we found here, my um, assistant and I, and we went back again and again for three day periods to camp and shoot this area, was a desert wash where um, a huge flood had gone through this area and kind of blow in blankets and detritus from people sleeping in the area uh, through and wrapped them around these dying parasitized trees. Um, if you read something like Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, it is redolent with images like this of a sort of um, defiled, mixed, inhabited, very, very edgy uh, desert landscape um, that's gone over the brink in terms of its ability to survive uh, in terms of water uh, and has turned into a sort of um, lawless wasteland and that's where all the sort of the sort of fantastical ideas about how you might survive in such a country are explored in her writing and um, so I just have a series of images from that place um, some of them on a huge large format camera, others uh, shot with 8x10 colour. Um, all very physical, I know we have to stop, so you can just flick through them. Um, and that's shot actually above White Sands um, uh, test range in New Mexico. And um, we won't even talk about, I think, these last images because I don't think we have time to talk about the science fiction work. Uh, yeah, does that sound right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, is that time? That's about time, yeah? I'm worried about time. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. <laughs>